The biggest thing that worries me about the B2B space is that 99% of the businesses have zero efforts to grow their brand or engage in marketing, at least not in brand marketing. They have a heavy reliance on sales. How do they expect that sales reps, employees, dealers, distributors, partners, customers are going to pick them over their competitors? Well, if you don't have a brand, you don't have a reputation, you have no marketing, then they won't because it's commoditized down to the product or service that you offer. And if there's at least one other player in your space that has just a little bit better reputation or brand, they're going to take so much business away from the uh, businesses that don't have any brand, don't have any reputation, and don't have any marketing. In this video, I'm going to talk about some of the biggest mistakes that B2B companies make when trying to build out their marketing. Things like not focusing on the right audience, trying to sell features versus benefits, not truly understanding your customers and what they want, and instead trying to just push what you want on them. There's a lot of different mistakes that businesses make, and so in this video, I'm gonna cover all of them. Hi everyone, I'm John Timmerman, CEO and founder of Good Monster. Welcome to my channel, welcome to the show. Today we're gonna to be talking about B2B marketing and the biggest mistakes that companies make when trying to build out their own marketing plan or, or marketing strategies. But first I wanna tell you a little story, okay? So uh, a while back I used to work for a company, um, they, were, they were a manufacturer, product manufacturer, right? So they didn't sell to consumers, they sold to other businesses. And in their space, uh, the typical landscape was to use manufacturers' reps, which is very common in the manufacturing space. Uh, these are these are contractors, right? These are not employees. These are other companies that basically sell your products for you, and they sell it alongside other product that they have in their portfolio. Generally, they're related to the same space, right? So this particular client that I worked with, they were in the food service space. So their manufacturers' reps also had other food service equipment that they were selling. And those reps then, they go to uh, dealers um, uh, uh, that sell those products for that particular industry. In this case, it was food service. So other food service dealers, uh, distributors, um, large distributors that distribute products to dealers. And then those dealers, and, then, and in some cases, those distributors then sell to uh, an actual restaurant or a hotel or a catering company or something like that, right? So there's lots of levels to get to the actual customer. And this company had built amazing reputation. They had a great product uh, in the industry that, that everyone knew that was in that manufacturer's rep, dealer, distributor world. But the customers had no clue who they were even though they were buying their products and they had a market share that was about 60%, well, it depends on the product, but they had a market share that was either 30% or 70%, depending on the product that they had. But the end user, the client, the customer, the restaurant had no clue who they were, what their brand name was. They just knew the product that they offered uh, and they, they knew the product that they made because they bought that through a dealer, right? Mm -hmm. So the problem then lied, lies, laid, whatever, uh, on the reliance on the dealers, on the manufacturer's rep and the distributors, the reliance on three other entities to sell your product. And that's a huge problem in the B2B space. Uh, and the main problem arose when COVID hit and that reliance on the dealers and distributors got crushed because yes, restaurants closed down for a period of time, right? But then what happened is the ripple effect went up from restaurants to dealers, to distributors, to reps, and then all the way to the manufacturers, right? There's so many levels that because everybody else's business got shaken up, the, the, there was a major delay that happened to get back. So when restaurants opened back up again, it wasn't immediate that the order started to take place. There was this ripple effect. Okay, so that's a that's a that's an issue with the distribution model, but a bigger issue uh, came to light because the brand of this particular company was unknown. So when restaurants opened and they needed a particular product, their their particular product, they would then go to the dealers and say, "Hey, we're opening back up. We need another supply of this." 
And then the dealer said, okay, well, we don't have a supply of that. Let me go and get it. So they went to the distributors or they went back to the manufacturer's reps and they said, hey, we need more of this. And then the manufacturer's reps said, okay, I'll go and look at it. But they're, uh, they're distracted by the other um, products that they're offering. And so eventually they went back to our client, my client, and said, hey, we need more of this. And that was, you know, two weeks later. By that time, uh, they had already gone with a competitor. So the fact that they didn't know who, what the company was of the thing that they were ordering was such a major problem because the convenience wasn't there. When if the brand was bigger and more well-known, that restaurant could have said, I would like a, a, another supply of product X, Y, and Z. And if the dealer didn't have it, they could then go and find that product somewhere else. And if that somewhere else couldn't do it, they could at least contact the company and say, hey, how do I get your product? So just that one small thing of not knowing what that product was caused our client to lose a bunch of sales to their competitor, which was well known because they do focus on sales and marketing. This is just one example of why brand and marketing is so important in the B2B space. And it's very important that a lot of you understand that it's currently not being utilized by a lot of your companies. And it's because <clears throat> they don't think they need it. We rely on sales. We rely on our manufacturer's rep to do all of that stuff for us. It's their job. Yes, it's their job. But the problem is you don't control your manufacturer's reps. They're not employees. You can't pivot quickly. You can't tell them do it this way instead of doing that way. They're going to do it the way they want to do it. And if you are lucky to have a good enough relationship with them, that's great. But um, the speed to move uh, in a way that allows you to pivot and grow quickly isn't usually there with the old school model. So my suggestion, what I'm going to cover in this video, is that you start to pay attention to brand marketing. That's different than a lot of the marketing in the B2B space. A lot of the marketing in the B2B space is like, I'm going to make some brochures that my manufacturer's rep can use. I'm going to make sure our website is updated. I'm going to make sure our catalog has the correct prices in it. All of that stuff is important. But that's internal sort of technical marketing. We're talking brand marketing. Do people know your company enough to be positively influenced by them and to take action and go seek you out when they have a need? Or no? Because if the answer is no, they're going to go with whatever brand they know. And typically that's your that's your, your competitor. So how do you approach uh, building a marketing plan? And what are the biggest mistakes that I see a lot of businesses making? That's what we're going to cover in this video. So let's dive in. Okay, so first, one of the biggest mistakes I see is not targeting the right audience. This isn't necessarily specific to the B2B space. This is consumer companies as well, but not targeting the right audience. And the easiest way to do this is to build like a matrix of your current customers. And for each customer, put in as much information as possible. What industry are they in? What is their niche? What is their focus? What's their revenue? Uh, where are they located? Build out their profile as much as possible. Do this right into a spreadsheet, Google Sheets or Excel. And so you put the columns in there, right? And then for each of your current customers, especially your top customers, let's say top 20%, Fill in each of the columns and then put your customers in the row and find commonalities, right? So at the bottom, group together the ones that are the majority. So where are the majority of your customers located? What industry are the majority of your customers in? What, what sub-industry or subcategory are the majority of your customers in? What revenue range is the majority of your customers in? So build that out. Okay, once you find the commonalities in the in the in the your avatar, we'll call it, of a perfect customer, then go one step further and talk about the job titles of the people who you deal with or need to influence the most. Is it the director of operations? Is it the buyer? Is it the uh, owner of the company? Who is it that you're looking to influence and usually is the one that hires you? Once you build this profile out, now you have a avatar, an avatar that you can use to make all your marketing and sales decisions. Because if something you write on your website or a video you create or a cold email template that you create isn't talking specifically to this avatar, 
then you need to change it. That's as simple as, as that. If it's not addressing your avatar in a way that meets them where they are and addresses their hopes, dreams, and fears in their business, then you need to retool it because it, you might miss. It might miss impacting your perfect customer. So that's the first mistake that I see is that companies get a little lazy or they just don't know how to create a perfect avatar that will then lead them to targeting the right audience every single time with every single piece of content that they make uh, uh, for their customer. The next mistake that I see is focusing too much on the features and not the benefits. Again, this isn't necessarily specific to the B2B space, but it's so common uh, uh, in all industries, and that is to not focus on the benefits. What are they going to get if they buy your product or engage with your service? Like, what is their life going to be like after? Not, hey, we offer a stainless steel version of this thing at the per, you know, this size, and our technology allows us to last 20 years instead of 10 years. Like, those are all good. Those are all good features, and they have a place, but it's not at the beginning. Right? That's the problem is that a lot of times companies flip-flop. They'll do the features first and then it will lead to the benefits. But the problem is people don't think like that. They don't make decisions like that. We make decisions first at a high level and then we get down into the details. So at the high level, when I see something, whether it's a brochure, a website, an ad, or a booth at a trade show, I'm going to first think, is, does this impress me? Is this worth my time? Is there something there that I should care about? And the thing that makes people care the most are benefits to them at the quickest, with, with the quickest amount of time or the least amount of time. So first, what are the benefits of the product that you offer? So let's come up with a random example here. B2B space, you're selling engine blocks to the auto industry. I don't know, right? Just the, just the steel, the, the metal, uh, you know, engine block itself with any, no components or anything connected. So what are the benefits of some automaker buying your particular engine block versus competitors? Okay. Well, uh, one potential benefit could be it lasts longer. Do you have some sort of proprietary technology, some sort of coding that allows it to maintain its performance longer or structural integrity longer? Now, engine block might might not be the best example because that's not something that necessarily goes, but we'll just keep going with it, right? So uh, if you have some sort of proprietary te technology that allows your engine block to last 20 years longer uh, on average than your competitors, that's your benefit right there. That's what you lead with. Studies show our engine block will give you 20 years more life. We'll, we'll get, here's the market room. Uh, studies show that our engine block will give 20 years more life to your vehicle's engines. That's the benefit, 20 years more life. Then you can go into the details a little bit further. But you have to think first, Number the number one mistake is not targeting the right audience. So you know your avatar already. You know what they care about and what their concerns are. Now go into the benefits to that particular t person uh, from your product, Okay. That's mistake number two, and the best way to do it is to know your audience, know who you're talking to, know what problems your problem, your product solves for them, and then lead with that benefit. Mistake number three is not offering a value proposition that is strong enough. So again, we just talked about the benefits, right? The benefit ties directly in with your value proposition. And the, uh, the benefits is, we'll call it step one, to creating a powerful value proposition. So now that you've identified the benefit that your engine block gives 20 years more life to vehicles that uses it, it's built using that engine block, now your value proposition can be created. And this is an actual statement that you might use in your marketing or your sales. You might put, put it in your brochures, on your website, on your banners at a trade show. Your people might actually say it, right? But now you can go and craft a very valuable value proposition that is used to close deals or initiate conversations about your product. So your value proposition, it might be the same. I think I already just created the value proposition in the, in the step before, but uh, our engine block gives 20 years uh, uh, to the vehicles that use it. 20 years 
more life. I already forgot what my value proposition is. Uh, our engine block gives 20 years more life to the vehicles, uh, to your vehicles. There, there's a value proposition. It's a singular focus, 20 years more life. Uh, it is very specific. The problem is it, it extends the life of uh, the, that part of the engine. And so now a vehicle automaker can think, well, we can use this in our own marketing. So that value, the benefit that you sold to an automaker is now something that they can use. So it's that value proposition became even more valuable to them. Okay. So when you're creating your value proposition, make sure it's utilizing your strongest benefit or two in some cases, and it's uh, addressed in a way that tells the purchaser, your customer specifically what they are getting when they engage with your brand. Now, if you offer tons of different products, your value proposition is probably not going to be on a particular product. It's going to be on maybe customer service. It's going to be on, you know, lower cost, uh, for, for purchases. It's going to be on quicker shipping. You know, there's, there's some other benefit that outside of just a product, right? But regardless of what it is, make sure that value proposition is something that's very focused. It's very easy to understand for your customers. Okay. The next mistake that I see in B2B marketing is not having a call to action. A call to action is one of the most basic things in marketing. Now it's not always, always used in every single piece of marketing. For instance, brand marketing is about a feeling. You're trying to initiate a feeling, an emotional response in somebody. And if you have a call to action in a brand marketing piece of uh, uh, content, it actually might be too salesy. However, there should be a funnel that leads to a call to action. There should, there should be no strings left unattached to any marketing campaign. This even goes for TV commercials and billboards and, and sort of high-end, high-funnel high uh, marketing content like that. There should be something that somebody can think to do after they see that, whether it's to go into a store and buy that beer that they saw on the billboard or go online and research the reviews that they saw from that TV commercial. Whatever it might be, there should be some underlying sort of action that you want somebody to take. But with B2B marketing, a call to action is very important. If they're reading a brochure that you made, there should be several sections and opportunities that you ask them to contact you, right? Contact your sales rep at, and then the phone number or email address. You could have that at the, underneath the title. You could have that on the cover. You could have it within the body of the text. You could have it on the back cover. You could have it in all of those places. If you're creating a video and you're talking about how great your culture is to work and your goal is to hire more talent, more people to work in your plant, then make sure that that video gives a call to action. Where do they apply? Should they call to interview, uh, you know, open interviews? Should they call in for an open interview? So make sure that there's always a call to action. The worst thing companies can do right now is to build a website or create a brochure that is simply just a, uh, a digital you know, or, or physical version of a business card. Like, here's what we are, here's our contact information, do with it what you will. That's the worst kind of marketing. People are hit with 4,000 to 10,000 ads and marketing messages per day. Do you think that they're gonna make the decision on their own to do something? No, we're so busy in our everyday lives and we're hit with so much that we need to be told what to do. And then we decide whether to do it or not. Okay, so the call to action is very important. You need to first make sure your message, your value proposition, all of that is in check, as I mentioned. But afterwards, make sure you add a call to action. Okay, this next one, I love talking about this kind of stuff. And it's not creating a customer journey literally creating and drawing what your customer does from the point that they need something that you might offer all the way to after they've actually made the purchase with you. Map that out so that you, your team, your reps, whoever might be helping you to sell or market your, your products has a concrete roadmap to follow. And then if they need to add or deviate from that because of whatever reasons, they can, but they have a roadmap. And the best way to do this is you'll notice all my steps are in order. Once you understand your customer, you create a value proposition, all of those things, then go ahead and create your customer journey. And here are some sort of sub steps that you can use to, uh, to start this, uh, building out this journey. 
Okay, next little sub step is to make sure you understand what the customer journey steps are. There's 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 many different types of customer journeys and you can make a really detailed if you want, but there are some common stages in the customer uh, journey that it can be used, whether you're a B2B company or a consumer company. The first is awareness. You know, you, you, they need to become aware of uh, solutions to their prob problems. So once they start to go look in Google or they go to a trade show or they, they go to a media publication, the awareness, getting their attention is sort of that first stage. Okay, when they go to Google and they search, that's the first page of all the listings. That's the awareness stage. Next comes the research stage. So research is now when they click into one of those links on Google or they go and visit a, one of the booths at a trade show and uh, start to research what that solution offers. Is it right for them? Is it too expensive? Is it just right? Um, you know, does it take too long or is it fast? That research phase is sort of when they're trying to figure out, should I engage or not? The next stage is evaluation. And this is where they're going to take all the information that they got in the research phase and start to evaluate, is it right for me or not? Next stage is a purchase, right? So if they're going to continue down the journey, they're going to make the purchase once they evaluate and they pick the one that they want. They're going to make the purchase, okay? Once they make the purchase, the final step is the after purchase. This is where it's customer service and customer engagement and facilitation. Sometimes it might be uh, cross-sells or upsells to continue that uh, customer relationship with them. But those are sort of the, the basic uh, steps or stages of a customer journey. So make sure you understand th those stages and then go ahead and sort of write out descriptions of how your customer will engage with that stage and how you can add value, your business can add value to those stages. All right, and the last little tip I have or sub tip here is to make sure you're creating content for each a customer in each of those stages. So this is another thing that I see uh, all the time in the B2B space is, is that companies don't truly understand how to connect with their customer. Generally they do. And the way they've always done it is something that's very comfortable. But to realize that people are in different head spaces at different points in their customer journey. Somebody who's in the awareness space, space is not going to react to a blog post or a video or a website the same as somebody who's in the purchase stage. And you need to understand this. So by uh, creating little uh, avatars and descriptions of how your company can add value to each of the customer stages, now you can go ahead and create content. For instance, let's use the tried and true brochure whether it's physical or digital. You might have a brochure for somebody who's in the awareness phase. It's very short, it's maybe a one pager, it's very simple, and it just has your value proposition on it. Another brochure might be made for somebody who's in the research phase. There's more details in it. Okay, there's more uh, nuts and bolts and things that they can really analyze and compare with other competitors. The evaluation stage probably bleeds into the research stage a little bit. So that brochure is going to help them evaluate and compare their, your competitors with yourself. And hopefully you're adding enough of the value proposition details into this brochure that allows them to make the right choice, which is you. Uh, for the purchase stage. Now the purchase stage is something that could be the previous brochure we just talked about, or it could be a separate brochure. If somebody verbally says, you know what, I'm interested in this, you might have a brochure that says what the benefits are after they've made the purchase and how to use it once they've made the purchase. This way they're getting a look into the future that if I buy this thing right now, here's what I will get. And then the post-purchase could be the same brochure or it could be an actual welcome packet. The welcome packet is a brochure that says, you are now a customer of ours, here's what to do next, and maybe here's a discount off for future services. So you can see how creating content for each stage uh, can help to convert more people no matter where they are. But you have to know your customers, you have to know your audience, and you have to know what stage they're in. Okay, another big mistake that I see all the time is having a disjointed marketing strategy. A lot of times in the B2B space, there's just one strategy. It's let's create our logo and brochure and business card and website package. Let's launch it and then let our sales reps do the rest, okay? So they're basically just focusing on the, the look and then the features of their product or their business. And then it stops right there, okay? Then what happens is that as things come down the pipeline, opportunities come, like a trade show, for instance, 
Okay, the trade show will say, hey, we want you to have a booth at our trade show. You can have a 10 by 10 or a 10 by 20 space. And we also offer, you know, uh, a spot in our email newsletter. We can put your logo and uh, we can put a little logo, an enhanced logo on our website for an extra $250. And somebody on your team's like, well, this sounds right, right? They're going to get us in front of uh, 10,000 people. So let's go ahead and pay for it. Okay, that goes well. You're at the trade show. You send two reps there that sort of just sit like this, hands behind their back, and they wait for people to come up and talk or ask for a free sample of a, coo a free koozie uh, with your logo on it. That event goes by. Then uh, a month later, the association that you're a part of reaches out and said, hey, we're, we have a new look and feel coming to our publication, and we're wondering if you want to put a one-page ad on there that talks about your business. You guys say, sure. Sure. Uh, what are we going to do? Okay, why don't we put our name, our logo, let's put a picture of our founder there and then list all the benefits. Um, I'm sorry, all the features of our product. Okay, and then we'll put that in there and then everyone will flip. And once they see it, they're going to like say, holy cow, this is a great business. I'm going to call them. Okay, and then you put the little website on the bottom, right? This is very disjointed. You're just letting things kind of come to you and you're letting other marketing channels or media channels sell you on their products. But there's nothing that's, uh, that you're selfishly looking at and saying, is this the best for us? And does this map to our one goal for this year? And this is where building out a marketing strategy. It could be a three-month marketing strategy. It could be a six-month, a nine-month, a 12-month. It could be a 10-year marketing strategy, although things change in 10 years, obviously. But having a strategy that is cohesive and leads to just one or two different major goals, and then you can reverse engineer milestones to this, is going to make your life more efficient, your business more effective, uh, your marketing more effective, and ultimately your business is going to grow because of it. So make sure when you're building a marketing strategy, you start with a goal in mind. Is it a revenue goal? Is it a market share goal? Is it a unit sold goal? What is that goal? After you have this goal in mind, then go to the next step down backwards and say, how do we get to this goal? Well, we need to influence this many people or we need to get in front of X amount of uh, decision makers and keep going down from there. And then as you reverse engineer, build out the actual types of content, website, videos, brochures, business cards, events, trade shows, uh, media publications, uh, press hits, uh, you know, whatever it might be, right? Build out the things that will help you get to that goal. Now you have a detailed, co cohesive marketing strategy. And when opportunities come down the pipeline, like a trade show or like an association publication that wants to run an ad, you can cross-reference that with your strategy to say, well, here's our goal. Here's how this ad could lead to this goal. So yeah, we're going to go do it. Or this trade show is a little bit, it's not our, it, it's in our industry, but it's not the customers that we want who are attending. So we're going to we're going to pass on that one. It will give you a better idea of what decisions to make along that the way. Okay, next mistake I see is not measuring your results. This is uh, this is less common in the consumer space because you consumer businesses make decisions on products and marketing and, and sales and things like that based on the data. But a lot of times in the B2B space, you are measuring a lot of things inside your business, like efficiency of equipment and uh, sales reps performance, things like that. But you're often not measuring your actual marketing performance. All these brochures and events and websites and videos that you're doing, are they actually doing anything? Because the way you're thinking, and I know this because I've been in the industry for a long time, what you're doing is you're saying, we're going to create a video that shows how awesome we are. Check. Done. That bucket is fulfilled, the video bucket. But what you should be thinking is, how can we make a video that impacts our customers to take action? And then how are we going to measure that action? That's the way you should be thinking about a video, a brochure, an event, a partnership, any sort of marketing efforts. You should be thinking, how do we make this the most impactful for people to actually take an action and then how are we going to measure that action? The, here's a perfect example. One of our clients just did a trade show. We built the booth. We facilitated the whole thing for them. And our goal was to get a certain amount of leads. 
And then out of those leads, based on their input, we said, how many of those leads do you think you could close if it's this type of lead? We built those numbers out. We went to the event and we measured how we stacked up against those numbers. And after the event, we were like, this has been successful because we surpassed our numbers. That's how you know, that's how you measure your marketing uh, efforts to see if they're successful or not. Otherwise, you're just taking a shot in the dark. Okay, and the last mistake, and this is a big one that, uh, again, not just the B2B space, but very prevalent in the B2B space. And that, that is to not adapt your marketing to the change in times or change in economy. Uh, uh, you know, it, COVID was different because it was so massively disrupting that companies had to change or they would die. But in most cases, there's small economic changes, um, you know, small industry changes that happen, and the marketing doesn't change. You don't see a lot of B2B companies saying, you know what, this is our customers now are getting used to buying things online. So we should be the first ones to start to offer places to get our products online, whether it's our own website or marketplaces or Amazon, you know, for business whatever those opportunities might be, that usually comes after a competitor is crushing you and you're like, shit, we should probably get on this. So a huge mistake is not looking ahead. Uh, oftentimes it's because businesses, B2B companies don't have a marketing person who's looking at these opportunities. They're so bogged down with day-to-day -day fires that they're putting out or little brochures that they're making that nobody's looking ahead. But one of the best things you can do is look ahead and start to notice opportunities for change to make your business better. I mentioned the e-commerce thing going online because that is a huge thing right now in the B2B space is that uh, the availability to get products online, even custom products online is growing super fast and it got exponentially even more prevalent during COVID and the pandemic because everybody went online for things because we were all home for a while and some businesses were closed and it took a long time to come back. You know, we had to do things online and on the phone. There wasn't in-person going on. There wasn't, you know, physical touch and feel much going on. So uh, the, I'll, I'll use my, my first example in the food service space. There's a lot of dealers and distributors that are building online e-commerce platforms so that restaurants don't have, have to go into a showroom. They don't have to call their rep all they do is go onto the website. They're like, I need 50 of these things, click purchase, and then they're shipped out. So that's a massive change that's happening. And the majority of the manufacturers and B2B businesses in that food service space are not adapting it right now. They're not because they don't have to. We're in, in the mindset is I'm going to do it the way we've been doing it until I can't anymore. And then I'll figure this new thing out. And that's just a bad way to go about it because everybody around you is going to pass you and it's going to be much harder for you to climb that mountain after everybody's already up there. There's no help. So if I can leave you with one bit of advice, it is to have somebody in your company focused on your brand and what everybody thinks about your brand, your business. What's their opinion of your business? What is the feeling that they get when you put out content, videos, things like that? Like, what is the overall sentiment about your brand? Start there and then go through this list of things uh, that I just mentioned. I'm actually pointing over here because I have a blog post that I wrote that goes into more detail uh, on my website. You can check it out, jtimmerman.com. If you want to read it a little bit more in detail, or you want to forward it to your team, use it as a kind of roadmap to try to get your marketing squared away. Uh, but the, the goal of all of these things is to build your brand into, into something that people remember to something that people go and seek out and look for, because then you don't have to worry and rely so much on sales for new customers. Now your sales is more like customer maintenance, facilitation, answering questions, things like that. It just makes your business much more efficient. If you found this valuable, you're super into B2B uh, or even commerce, I talk in this channel all about business and commerce and how to sell more things in the world we live in today. So subscribe, forward it to a friend, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.